We're live, we're live. Let me turn off the, the jammy jams. And uh, we have a good show for you today on the Core 80, episode 8 on the Core 80 call. Because we're calling out the 80, the Core 80 com- composers at the Academy of Composition. And, uh, you know, this is good stuff. We're doing good stuff here. We're moving a lot of energy. We're sending out the vibe, sending out the call, and uh, that's right, 80, we're calling you, so get on with it. Uh, We're going to talk about death today. Um, I was talking to an artist, Gary, yesterday, and uh, one of his favorite artists is uh, Howard Pyle. And Howard Pyle was an amazing, amazing illustrator. He also taught many of the great illustrators like uh, N.C. Wyeth and these guys. Um, now, uh, people like Norman Rockwell, they were taught, they weren't taught by Howard Pyle, but they were taught by George Bridgman. So George Bridgman and uh, Howard Pyle were two of the uh, profound teachers of of these great illustrators and painters that came out of, uh, out of America. And so... Uh, we're going to take a look at a couple of these Howard Pyle, uh, Howard Pyle paintings, two of them, and uh, they deal with death, and death is a beautiful thing. Now, most people are terrified about it because they don't have peace about it. Uh, most people, before as they get closer to death, they regret stuff. Um, you know, I only have really one regret in my life, and it's not a regret because... It would have taken me on a path that ultimately would have not led me here. But uh, I'll tell you the story real quick. When I was about 17 years old, I used to do caricatures. And um, I was at this um, county fair type of thing. And I did this caricature of this woman. Uh, she was a very beautiful woman. Um, and, and she loved the caricature. So her and her husband invited me over to their house for Christmas, for a Christmas party that they had, uh, and they hired me to do caricatures for their guests, which was really, really fun. And uh, and so I got there, I crushed it, it was an amazing time, took care of the guests, we had a lot of laughs, it, it, the artwork was good, the caricatures were good. It was, it was very, very cool. Well, they actually happened to be the owners of Van Scoy Diamond Mine in our area. And so they offered to me an apprenticeship with their uh, jeweler to learn how to cut diamonds. And um, and this is probably, I, I think, really the only regret that I have in my life is that I didn't take it. I got, I got afraid. And, you know, I came up with all these stupid excuses. Oh, what if my car breaks down on the way there? I don't know, just stupid stuff. I mean, you know, stupid, 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 stupid reasoning. Um, but I was just scared, you know. I was scared of stepping in and taking and owning that place and being, uh, hey, Alec, nice to see you there, man. Get your brother on this thing. He needs to be listening. So, uh, and so I was just, afraid, afraid of whatever. Maybe I didn't think I deserved that type of uh, attention or quality of uh, education. I don't know, whatever it was. Um, But I didn't take it. And so uh, uh, as life came on, you know, as I went throughout life, there were other times where where similar opportunities came up and I, I freaking, you know, like a vampire bit it in the neck and took that and drank it all. (laughs) And, uh, um, so the thing, what I'm trying to communicate is don't get to the end of your life with regrets. You know, if you want to be an artist, if you want to be a profound artist, if you want to be someone who's out there communicating great ideas long after you're dead, because the paintings that we're looking at are by dead people. Now they weren't painted by dead people, but the people are dead now. So 
you know, I don't fear death. I embrace it. I love the idea of me dying one day. I actually have it all planned out on my 99th birthday and everything else. So I'm, I'm weird like that. But the reason why I don't fear it is because I'm absolutely at peace with myself in it and um and in life like i don't i don't i remember when i was in my early 20s i came to a place in my life where i was just like wow i'm really at peace with this and everything from this point on is just cherries on top you know and that doesn't mean life is easy because it's it's hard as shit i mean it's it's hard right <laughs> and you got ups and downs and roller coasters and you got times when you're on the mountain and times when you're in the valley of the death right but no matter where you is you got to be is where it is you know <laughs> as bill would say no matter where you are you got to you got to choose who are you going to be and i choose i'm going to be a man of peace i'm going to be at peace I'm not going to have any regrets. Now, there is one slight fear that I have with death. And that is not standing before my maker being judged because, you know, I watched a naughty video one day or uh, I looked at some girl when she walked by or I got angry and I swore or some stupid stuff like that. I don't fear that kind of stuff. What I fear is the maker saying to me, I sent you there for a purpose. You were to take this information and get it to the people, and you didn't do it. That 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 rebuke is what scares the living crap out of me. So I make sure I get up every day and push this ball forward because in my mind, I'm not going to stand before the maker not that I could actually stand before the maker, but you know what I'm saying. Stand before the maker and 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 have him say, uh, you were lazy. You didn't do what I told you to do, you know. You didn't go out. I gave you a burning desire in your heart and you didn't follow it, okay. So that is um, the only part of death that I fear. And then all, and honestly, I don't even fear that because I know that the maker is such full of grace and such mercy that, you know, it's all it's all it's all laid out. So I'm just moving. I'm just moving with the wind, moving, m moving with the wind. So the whole point of all that is if you want to learn how to compose, if you want to learn how to draw, if, uh, if not draw, but if you want to learn how to compose, if you want to learn how to design um, and you have ideas that you want to communicate, stories that you want to share and tell, but you need somebody to kind of help guide you through that process so that you can become, you know, like your own little Superman, your own little superhero. To the audience that, that, that is hungry for what you have to say, there's an audience for us all. And you need to start honing that, that message and getting it out there. Now, our vehicle is painting, drawing, you know, uh, visual communication, fashion design, architecture, it doesn't matter. You still got to compose it all. You still got to think about the concepts that, you, that you're trying to communicate. And then you got to compose and design that for effective communication. So if this is important to you, if what I'm saying is resonating with you, well, then you belong in the core 80. I'm not here to sell you anything. You, you know if you belong in the core 80 or not. And if you don't, well, maybe you belong in the, the center 300 or the 2500 or whatever. Or maybe you don't even belong with us. That's fine. Maybe you just like moving paint and painting pretty pictures that are going to hang up on someone's uh, refrigerator. Um, you know, maybe you're really, really good at painting. But you like copying photos. Uh, you know, maybe that's what you like to do. That's cool. But if that drives you insane and you're sick and tired of copying a photo and you want to learn actually how to freaking say something, well, then you know where to come. The core 80. What we're going to call home. All right. So come on home and don't die before you come home. All right. We ain't going to take you in the house if you're dead. So let's get on to some artwork and some good stuff. <laughs> uh, you see behind me. I got one of our major grids up here. This is actually what we call the Snell Cheetah Grid. 
There's a reasoning for that. I'm not going to get into it. But yes, that is one of, uh, one of the grids from the academy. Now, I only have that posted up behind us because we're actually going to talk a little bit about grid work today in the Howard Pyle um, uh, illustrations. So let me go ahead and bring up some Howard Pyle illustrations. Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba 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 -ba. All right, episode eight, and let's start with this painting here. Let me get back here. All right, so when I take a look at this painting, it's a pretty cool painting, man. You know, I'm assuming that's little Georgie up in the front there, George Washington. You know, it was said that George Washington would go out into battle and all these bullets would come, pew, 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 you know, it'd go through his uh, jacket. Um, but he never got hit by a bullet. And, um, and so they used to believe like he had like this little divine uh, protection over him. And so um, when I hear that story and then I look at this painting, it kind of resonates together. Uh, and so there's some neat things going on in this painting, and we're also going to take an, uh, a look at, a, at another painting by uh, Howard Pyle, uh, the Bunker Hill one. So in this image, there are a couple things that I see right away. I see a strong vertical, and I see a very, 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 very strong repeated diagonal, and then... Uh, juxtaposing that diagonal is another diagonal. So let me show you what, a, what I see when I see this image. Okay. Now, when I see this image, I see the George Washington figure on the, on the left-hand side coming up, creating a vertical that comes in alignment with the flag. Okay. So let me go back to the original. Boom. You see that? It creates a very strong vertical th uh, thrust. It is the most powerful vertical thrust in the image. Now, everything behind George is basically uh, on one of two. Uh, it's, it's, it's either on a sinister diagonal or a Baroque diagonal. Okay, the sinister is coming from the top left to the bottom right. The Baroque is coming from the bottom left to the top right. So when we look at this, we can see that. We can see the clouds are all on that Baroque angle. It's coming from the bottom towards the top, okay? Underneath that, where you see the first row of the guys that are basically, it's George and then a, a, the first line of, uh, of guys, and then there's another line of guys after them. Um, that first line is there, but they're all constructed on a really, really uh, dominant diagonal. And by, by, when I say constructed, look at the guy in the middle here with the white who's beating on the drum. His Look at the shirt, right? It comes down, it, it forms the top of this guy's hand, it, it comes and forms the shirt of the, uh, the, the, the guy's shirt. It rides up, forming the angle, the thrust of the, uh, of the flag, okay? So this is being repeated constantly through this um, area. Even down in the grass, you can begin to see that same energy, that same thrust being moved forward, okay? Now, if you look at the sky, boom, okay, it has a very different uh, angle to it, right? It's coming down and it's being repeated in this other angle that's coming down. Now, what's interesting is I think... Uh, Maybe one reason why uh, Howard Pyle did did this was to say that the men had George Washington's back, and the men are the thrust that's coming from uh, that that bottom thrust, right? And so you could say that the earth was backing George Washington, the men were backing George Washington, and the heavens were backing George, because the heavens are coming down. And what's neat is if we follow them down. Boom. You can see the thrust coming up behind George, and then there's a thrust coming down. You could say it's coming from the back of George. And what happens is, as they cross over, there's a space that's created, and there is George. He just sits perfectly in there. Okay? Now, if we go straight across, 
past the, the, the first line of men, there's a guy who gets his face shot up, right? It's, it's pretty sad, but uh, it is what it is. So if you look right there in the center of the image, bam, he, gets his, he's, he has a bullet in his face, okay? Now, uh, the way I found that was I noticed that the horse in the background was bucking back. And it was bucking back on a pretty steep angle. And so I just followed the design. The, the, the design is an angle. Notice that the uh, angle of the front of the horse's neck, if you follow that straight down, not straight down, but like follow that angle down, it, it comes in alignment with the black pants of the guy who's beating the drum as he's walking. Isn't that kind of cool? I mean, that's just a huge thrust from his leg, his thigh up into the, up into the horse's face. So now when it really feels like there's this tight uh, energy that's going on in this image, um, and if it was flipped and it was a Baroque, we would feel like we were part of the army, you know, marching with the army, and you'll see that in the next image. But in this way, it's built on a sinister d d direction, and so as we're looking at it, we feel like the like this cut edge comes to comes into the drum, and so I wonder if uh, you know that's part of the the sound or the beat of the drum, you know. So it's interesting. Uh, let's take a, a look at another aspect of these design of this design. So we saw this this part of the story, and let us go to this part of the story. All right, so now we're going to be dealing with some grid work. I'm not going to get into the grids too much here, but I'll explain to you why there's two different grids. If you look at the first set of illustrations, the first set of uh, this, the first image, these are actually two squares that are laying over top of each other. Okay, so if you come from the top which let's say is four inches and we come down and it's another four inches it creates a square and then you go from point to point uh, connecting the corners and now it gives you two 45 degree angles so once we have that square with two 45 degree angles we're going to copy it and bring it down to the other side of the rectangle of the image and that's how we have two overlapping squares and we call that a uh, rebated square okay now when you look through the rebated square and you come along the lines that are in that square look at like in the center at the top where the flag is it comes down and then all of a sudden that other line is where the gun is placed on right in front of the horse okay so you can see that that's pretty cool uh, as you're coming down further you can see the the guy's arm um, and, and the hand and the shirt are all on that 45 degree angle that's in the top square. Uh, you can see that the guy's jaw and his ear uh, is on the bottom 45 that's leaning into a Baroque angle. Um, so if you just kind of follow through, I mean the guy's knee who's beating the drum, you know, all these points converge right into that spot, which actually makes sense because if you really look at that area, one could say that it's that area in which the um, the drum is being beat. Boom, right? Um, coming up through George's uh, pants. If you go, there's a strong vertical in there as well. But I just want you to look at the diagonals. So there's a lot of information going on here. The, the horizontal where the guy he gets his head shot, look at the back of his head and his shoulder and the drum and all that stuff lines up right there on that horizontal. And his arm that's coming up to catch his head is coming up on that 45 degree angle. Now, if we look at the next image, these are called reciprocals. And it's the same principle. It's a box with two lines in it, two like crisscrossing lines. Um, but with this one, what we're looking at is if we look at the full image, the whole image, we're going to go from the top left hand corner to the bottom right and the bottom, bottom left to the top right. And that gives us two what we call dominant diagonals, dominant Baroque, dominant sinister angles. And if we copy that and we rotate it and shrink it down and we bring it up to the, to the top and one to the bottom, just like we did in the other image, it gives us another set of, uh, of lines. Okay, these, set, these sets of lines are called reciprocals. Okay, so we can see now that the flag the edge of the, the the front of the flag goes through that one dominant 
uh, sinister. Uh, the the horse, the line of the horse and the guy's leg and all that stuff goes through that other baroque, that dominant baroque. And inside the reciprocal, let's look at the top. We can see that the horse's head um, goes through that uh, sinister that's coming across for the reciprocal. George Washington's neck and the bottom of his head comes through that uh, baroque sinister. I mean, the baroque reciprocal. And in the bottom of the image, we can see that the hand of the guy comes through that reciprocal. And um, if we look at the sinister reciprocal uh, in the bottom, you can see that it sets the tone for the, the way that the grass is being laid in, the pattern of the grass. And so, um, so there's a lot of alignments. Also, the guy who gets his head shot, you know, he, he's coming through that major... Uh, Baroque as well. So these are just two uh, ways to order um, your grid and when you're actually composing you want to do both. You want to bring in your uh, rebated squares and you want to bring in your reciprocals because they, they all come from the rectangle that you're working in and so they give you a natural order, a natural harmony um, and there's a whole reasoning why uh, for, for that and let me tell you here that this is not a golden section rectangle just because you see lines breaking up the image does not mean that it's golden section or divine proportions or anything like that but the principles used are identical okay so it's the same principles of how you divide up a rectangle how you work within a rectangle how you work within a uh, uh, squares and, and, and those kinds of things, but it is not a golden section proportion, and so therefore it's not a golden section rectangle, but it is the same principles. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and move on to the next one, the next image. This is the Battle of Bunker Hill, and this is actually one of my favorite paintings. It, it was so fun to, uh, to, to study somehow I came across it a few years back and I just thought it was so cool and um, uh, because when I look at a painting I see animation I don't see just a captured moment in time I see a, a beginning a middle and an end I see movement you know when I look at this picture uh, this image the, for me the clouds in the back the smoke the gunfire the cannon smoke all of that that's just not standing still for me when i look at it, it i feel it moving i feel it being washed up the up the hill and washed down the hill like all of this dark area here in the front you know to me i can feel the blood just flowing down that hill from all of the people who were being shot uh in this case the english um and uh it's a very profound piece when you begin to look at it and study it closely. So, why don't we go ahead and do that? Now, oftentimes a great illustrator will have... Um, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing something in the painting right now that I didn't pick up on before and I just wonder what the significance of it is. All the way in the back you can see it looks like a church and there's a really high point of contrast with that black door or that black tunnel on the front of that church and I'm trying to figure out what's the significance of that um, and that would be an interesting uh, thing to research anyways when I look at this image we you know we see we, we feel the marching of these soldiers you feel the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You feel the pulse, the marching. Boom, 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 boom. You feel the beat of the drum, you know? So the question is, how the heck do they make you feel that way? Why do they make you feel that I mean, there's so many things going into this image. When I, when I look at this and I begin to allow my ears to hear what my eyes are seeing, now that might sound really, really strange to you, right? That I allow my ears to hear what my eyes are seeing. It shouldn't sound strange to you at all, 
Because when you read, that's exactly what you're doing. You're allowing your ears to hear what your eyes are seeing. Think about it. Think about it. So when we look, when we're reading a painting, we should be able to do the same thing. Or we should hear sound. We should be able to hear things going on inside of us that our eyes are experiencing. Okay. So for me, I hear the marching. I hear the the the, the chaos of this war, right? I hear the beating of the drum. I mean, if you look at this guy right dead smack in the center, the first uh, red coat in the in the back row, look at the curve that he that his that his belly is on, okay? And his jacket creates a curve. His leg follows that curve. It comes down into the dead guy down on the ground. You feel you see that curve. Now that curve is repeated in the back of the guy in front of him, and in the front of the guy, and and so on. And so it creates this vibration. This visual vibration that keeps moving, a wave that keeps moving through the image up the hill, right? Because that's what the drum is, is boom. Look at the drum as a circle, right? So when he hits that, it vibrates up the hill. Now, what's interesting about great illustrators is a lot of times they'll set a scene, like in the last image, you know, Georgie, you know, leading a group of guys. But then there's a sub-story. There's another story inside that story. So this story would be the Redcoats going up to Bunker Hill, and then the Bunker Hill, you know, the guys, you know, don't shoot them until you see the white of their eyes, bang, bang, bang. And so all of this red that's at the top here, those are the Redcoats, the rows and rows. I mean, I, I just I can't imagine how many British families you know, send their young men and their husbands and, and, and the men and their family off to war for them to never come home. I mean, I, I, and here they are, you know, laying in the ground. And, um, and the amount of blood that flowed down that river, I mean, down that hill, you know, I mean, you can see it. Now, it's very possible that there's a shadow from smoke above them but uh, but I don't think that's what that is so anyways what's interesting about this piece is as we're seeing this advancing army marching and marching up this hill there's something interesting that occurs look at the back of the hill and her eye comes up and then there's this dark uh, line that comes across and so if our eye follows that, and then there's this interesting curve that occurs. And what happens is that if your eye comes down, back down towards the bottom of the painting, uh, along that curve, along that angle and curve, it comes through, and then you see this guy, he has his hat. But it looks like his hat is like extra long, and it really isn't. It's just the way it's designed, the guy in front of him, off to the side. And both their hats kind of create this interesting tangent. Now, it almost looks like a mistake until you realize where it leads you. It leads you. So you come through this guy's long, long hat. Down. What is that on the ground? Holy crap. That's a guy who just got shot in the head. Just like in the last painting. Do you see, like... It's just not an image of a moment in the war. We've, we're witnessing marching. We're witnessing the sound, the beat of the sound of the drum. We're witnessing the explosion. You know, and this thing, I mean, I love how this whole line comes back to a pivot. And as that thing moves, you can almost feel like, I mean, you could feel the marching of, 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 of how they're going to go up that hill, right? I mean, you feel that. That, that sweeping curve, it's a big sweeping curve up the hill. And in the midst of this, bam, he designs it so that we get to experience and feel this guy just getting shot right in the head, dropping. Now what's interesting is if you follow that path up where the guy's hat gets really long, you can just 
follow it up slowly with your eye, you'll see all of the connections. You'll see how everything's curved into each other. But it's also funny that he puts the this uh, this guy who was standing next to him, his head turns like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> the guy just next to me got shot, you know, I'm gonna get shot, you know, um, and uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's some scary stuff. You see the guy in the in the in the middle row there, he's got shot or beat in the head at some point, but he's back up and walking forward. Um, so let's take a look at that again. Bam. It's right there. Now, if we come in and we lay in a square, a rebated square, okay, that means we're taking, in this case, the height of the image, and we're coming in the same distance to the width, we draw a vertical line, okay? Bam! Look at that vertical line. What happens on that vertical line? Oh, the guy who got his head shot up, you know, that's where he is. He lands right on the vertical line. Uh, some of the guns, the guns, and this guy down here in the bottom right-hand corner land on that vertical line. Look at the diagonal from the top right-hand corner that comes in on that 45, which creates that square on the left. Look at how perfect the guys uh, are lined up on that 45-degree angle. Now, as they come through here, their legs start to, to come down, and now we see their butts are lined up on that... Um, on that angle. So there's a little shift in there. The guy with the drum, you can see his legs and the guy behind him. All of those are 45 degree angles. It's repeating that, that 45 degree angle, but the drum lands on there as well. So, you know, he's not only designing the story, he's designing the layout. How all of these pictures, how are all of these uh, um, objects, the people, the drums, like everything. Where are they going to be? Why do they go there? How do they support the story? How do they help communicate the story? What effect does it give to the viewer? These are all the kinds of questions that a composer thinks about. It's just not about, ooh, did I draw the, dr the drum pretty enough? You know, or does it look like a drum? You know, um, it, it's, you know, did I copy the drum right? You know, did I copy the, the dress of these guys right? No, it, that, that's part of it. If, if that's part of your style and that's important to you, that's fine. But if you're not composing, then all you're doing is copying. And that's, you know, at the Academy we say stop copying, start composing. Because it's in the composition that the magic happens, not in the copying. We can give you respect for copying, but there's no magic in it. So let's go here. We can begin. We can see again. Uh, we have what we call a Saint Andrew's cross going on in here, and it creates a diamond right in the center of this image where all this action is happening. But look at all of the lines inside that center that are on, built on that 45 degree angle. Here, I'll go back to the original so you can see it. Do you feel how all those angles coming down that same exact angle? Why would he do that? Well, because it's a technique of repetition. And by repeating it and repeating it and repeating it, you get it. You feel that movement. That's what's important in that area is that your eye moves in that direction. Why? Because it brings you back to the guy who got shot in the head. Because that's really what this painting is about. It's about the guy laying on the ground with a bullet in his head. Now, what's interesting is if you see uh, where these lines converge, they create these points and... Wherever there's a point, you can draw either a 45 degree angle, a vertical angle, or a horizontal one. So in this case, if we draw a horizontal, it goes right through the guy's head. So even where that guy is placed is strategic in this image. He's just not arbitrarily you know, drawn in in that area. You know, he, he's plotted its draftsmanship, it, draftsmanship, it's composing, it's designing, it's intentional. This is what composers are. There is a place for being intuitive in the beginning when we're trying to create our idea and get our movement. But then once we get past that point and we know what it is that we want to compose, then we get, we, then we get intentional. And that's what design does. It helps us uh, be intentional artists, not just arbitrary ones. Um, the message is so far more important than the medium. Absolutely, man. Martin, 
Don uh, Neutrum says that the message is far more important than uh, the medium, and it always is. You know, I can the medium when loving somebody is words or a hug or a gift or spending time with them or doing a kind act. Those are the mediums, but the message is what's important. It, it's it's do you want to communicate love? Yes or no. If you do, now the, that's the important part. But then you, then you need to, at some point, master your medium as well. You need to, if you're going to choose to communicate and compose, and you want to do it in paint, well, then you're gonna, you're gonna need to master the paint. But the painting itself is not the message. It's the medium. But, but medium without a message is just. Oh, that's neat. But there's not, it doesn't give you anything. See, I love in the... Uh, in the biblical... <laughs> in the Bible... Um, there's... Uh, in, you know, in this little creation story, it talks about Adam and Eve. And it says... Uh, and it calls Adam, which means man. And then Eve, which means, which means being. And so, um, you know, when you're just a man, you know, you're just of the earth. You're just a medium, if you will. It gets very lonely. There's really, there's a cool factor to it, but it's only when you bring in the being, when you're actually being something or being someone, you know, uh, when you're expressing something. It, but you need both. You need, you know, to be a human being, you have to be human and you have to be, you have to be being, you know, right? You have to be something, you know? We <laughs> um, could say you have to do something, you know? Um, but it's the combination of the two that makes us so amazing. Uh, and so I, I love the fact that that's kind of part of those stories um, and, 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 uh, and ancient wisdom is the fact that, you know, there's a lot of people who are just human, you know, they're going through the motions. There's a lot of artists out there who are mastering the mediums, you know, they're masters of their medium, but they ain't got no message. Or they have messages and they're masters of their medium, but they haven't figured out nobody's come along, you know, like a little Yoda in their life to show them. And they might have had other Yodas that taught them how to mix paint and color match and all these other, you know skill sets but they haven't had a yoda come along in their life that leads them into their skywalker years you know what i'm saying into like into the power of the jedi into the power of the force and that's what the academy does we we, we get into the force you know the force is dealing with the invisible reality and being able to manipulate it for uh in our case good because we're jedis we're not we're not sith so um so when we start moving the eye, you know, we're doing our little Jedi mind tricks on you. <laughs> uh, it's the same principles, man. You know, we're controlling the things you can't see. You know, the force, if you will. This invisible movement, this invisible thrusts that go on in an image. We are controlling them. We're creating them. We're composing them. We are telling you that your eye is moving from here to here and here, and it's going to do it at this point. And... Unless you're blind, your eye's going to move that direction. Now, what's interesting is, as you begin to uh, become more conscious of this, become more aware of this, then you'll be able to develop a language to articulate what's going on, okay? Um, that comes with time. But even without the language, you still are feeling and experiencing it on a subconscious level because... You know, if I put you in a white room and I draw a, and I take a big paintbrush with a bl bl black paint and I paint a very large vertical on a on a on a wall, and the whole room is white, what do you think you're gonna see? Is your head gonna go from left to right? No, it's gonna go from top to bottom or bottom to top, because there is a huge black thrust on your wall. Okay, that's what you are going to do. Um, 
and there might be that one or two percent who are, are either blind or, or you know, got something messed up in their head that it's not going to make them move that way, and that's fine. But the other 80 to 98 percent of people, it's going to work for, and that's why these guys are brilliant. It still works for them. Now, you may not like these kinds of paintings. That's a taste thing. That's something different. But outside of your taste, um, the the compositions work, okay, and and that and that's that's another level of appreciation. So, um, on that note, guys, uh, we did talk about some grid work in this image. So I want to show you one of the artists that we're training here at the academy. Her name is uh, Charlene. There's beautiful Charlene. Um, and what Charlene's doing is she's using these grids. We, we have grids uh, at the academy. Uh, so that you don't actually have to go through all of the rigorous learning of how to use these systems, how to build these systems. I've already built them all out for you, so you just get them, uh, and then you start playing and experimenting with them. We give you some instruction in them, uh, but they really do a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, one of the artists, uh, John, he said uh, that they were like composition calculators because they just plan everything for you. It's just right there. And so here's one of the images, uh, Charlene, she's a florist, and so she's working with uh, designing out these flower images. Um, so here is uh, four grids that are up on the wall. Uh, we have the snail turtle, we have the snail cat, uh, we have the snail, snail wolf there. Behind me, we've got the snail cheetah. Okay, the snail represents the square, and the cheetah represents the, the special rectangle that's on that's in the inside of that. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, yes, that's the the new Core 80 shirt. Okay, the C80 baby, <laughs> the C80 baby. So uh, uh, that this I had the Core 80 on yesterday, so this is a C80. Um, and if you watched the video yesterday, put in the comments which one you like better, the, the Core 80 or the, or the C80. All right. Now back to Charlene. So here are four different grids. And you can see how in each grid they are designed with the same exact principles. But because of the different diagonals, they generate different vibration, different frequency, different energy. Now what's beautiful is we have seven grids. We actually have eight because we have a square, but since all the squares are here, the, the other seven are inside those squares. And it's just kind of cool because Charlene, in her case, she has um, seven brothers and sisters, including ourselves, so there are seven of them. And so she's really, she's arranging we use that word intentionally because she's a florist. She's arranging her flower drawings, her flower designs, um, on the seven different grids. And she's taking each grid, the energy of each grid, and, and associating it with one of her siblings. And, uh, and so each painting will be one of the siblings. And, um, and it's going to be a beautiful little collection, a beautiful collection. So here she is. Uh, with all of the uh, the seven grids up on the wall. Um, and just take a look. I want you to feel the difference in the energies that are going up there right now. And and how each grid has its own armature. We call it an armature. Um, and then we also call the lines in that armature a gamut. So it's the own, their own range of, uh, of directions. It's funny, I like the uh, window behind her because it has its own order as well. <laughs> so, uh, but you get become you get, you become sensitive to these things as you're as you're developing and 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 learning about these grid systems, which honestly have been around. Artists have been using them for five, six, seven thousand years now. Um, you go all the way back to the Babylonians and the the Mesopotamians and the Sumerians and the early Egyptians and all that stuff. They were all using this stuff to. Uh, to order and compose uh, their images in their temples and their um, um, artifacts and everything else. So um, what I want you to look at real quick is look at the top three and notice that there's a circle in the center of each of those squares, right? But they're not circles, they're actually con constructed with straight lines, but you can see how 
they each have different uh it's almost like an eyeball uh when you put light in it the what do they call it um when the iris expands and then gets small again so if you look at that it's 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 interesting how there's just these different uh, patterns that are created just because of different line directions, and that's all it is. And I'll explain that stuff uh, maybe in another video. Uh, definitely you'll learn all those things once you get into the academy. So again, if you want to be part of the Core 80, then uh, Facebook message me, um, and you know, you'll know you'll end up getting access to this uh, rich information. Also, you'll learn how to tell stories, how to dig into your own personal stories, and since we were dealing with paintings of death, my call to you today is do it before you die, baby. Do it before you die. Because once you're dead, your art is dead too. And uh, sad thing is the, the, the graveyards are full of master paintings and great ideas and stories that were never written and paintings that were never painted and music never composed. Uh, because people either waited or they got hit by a bus or whatever it was, you know. Most of the time, it's because they deferred their dreams. They deferred their passion, you know. A baby started crying and they had to go feed the baby, you know. And they made that choice. And we should never say anything against that. Um, but the babies are out of the house now or they're about to go out of the house. Make some time for you. And if... Uh, and if you know, you always wanted to be a, an artist that was sharing great things, especially if you're retired and you don't necessarily need to, um, you know, paint a painting to, to pay your light bill. You know, if you're if you're one of the lucky ones that are in that position in life, uh, you know, you got your, your retirement, you got your investments, you you know, you you you, you did. You lived in this system and you did the system the way the system is set up and and you're in that place now you're trying to figure out okay what I'm gonna do with my time well if you always wanted to be a, a composer I mean not a composer but like an artist and you always wanted to communicate ideas visually well then this is a place for you you know so well it potentially could be a place for you we got to still interview you and make sure that you know the the vibe is right uh, because we are very, very serious about what we do, and we don't want to um, uh, dilute what we're doing with uh, nonsense. Okay? Uh, so, um, but uh, if you hear this and it's resonating with you, then most likely you belong in, in this core. So, that's today's show, the Core 80 call we're calling you out we're calling you forth we're calling you to follow us to join us to be with us to lead us all that good stuff and uh and to uh leave a legacy leave a, a record of your of your time in this earth through through your medium um which is uh visual art okay uh, but over medium is message and so we compose not only art but also life and on that note, I'm going to stop and I'm going to say, ciao, baby. Ciao. See you tomorrow.